Okay, everybody have a lesson? Be sure you, you will need one tonight. Well, you, I learn something from my patients every week. What I learned this week, a lady came in to see me, and I hadn't seen her in a year, and we were going over medication lists, and I said, I gave you a pill last year, and I forgot to tell you. I said, I, I, knew it was, I know it's a real big pill, and uh, it's a pill that coats your stomach. You take it before meals, you know. And, uh, but I forgot to tell you, it's so big that, that you can actually dissolve it in water and then drink it, you know, before meals. She said, Doc, that's okay. I said, I, I know you didn't tell me that, but she said, I figured out how to swallow it. She said, I just roll it in butter, and it slides right down. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I'm kind of sitting over there thinking, looking at the weight gain from last year, thinking maybe we're rolling some other things in butter too, you know. <laughs> so anyway, there's your solution to big pills, roll it in butter. <laughs> then uh, just a minute ago, Ann was here, and John, you hadn't come in yet, and I asked if you were coming tonight, if you were sick or something. She said, no, he's washing his hands, getting the hot dogs off his hands. So I guess y'all had the hot dogs yeah. back in there. And thought of a story I hadn't thought of in years and years. I was a medical missionary back in Nigeria before, when I finished all my training, I did that before I set up shop in America. And and uh, I was visiting one time with the administrator of the hospital where I worked. And he was a fellow about 40 at the time, and he had been recognized by missionaries years before as being a really sharp guy. So the missionaries raised funds and sent him to America, so he got a four-year education at a Christian college. So we were talking about, you know, I, I said, tell me about the, you know, when you first got there. What was it like to be in the, from the jungles of Nigeria, never having seen anything else, and then you get on a plane and come off, and you're in, you know, America. You know, what it was like? He said, well, he said, I, he said the first thing, I, he said, the most important thing I remember, or the most dramatic thing, oh, let me back up a minute, okay? In the jungles of Nigeria, there, people don't have pets. I mean, we're talking about people just, you know, eating anything they can. The only dogs that are over there are just scroungy, wild dogs that just kind of, uh, you know, kind of like catfish and ocean. They just get what they can to eat. So that's the only concept of a dog that he had. Anyway, so he said, I get off the plane, and uh, they come and get me, take me to the dorm, and, and show me where the dining hall is. And so supper comes. He said, so I'm in line with my tray, and I come down, and it's my turn. And the lady says, would you like a hot dog? He said, no dog, no dog, no dog. <laughs> anyway. We just kind of take things for granted. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so John, you made me think of that tonight. Okay, um, this will be our last lesson, Nehemiah. And the uh, pastor asked me Sunday, you know, or he talked to me Sunday. He uh, said in, in the uh, Get Acquainted class, they were talking about some of the science lessons we taught in the past. And, and and I told him that, you know, I really haven't had a word from the Lord about what to teach next, but I've had enough people ask me about those science lessons. I think we're going to revisit some of those. Um, you know, in the past, over the years that we've taught here, we've kind of had three different series. One was medical science in the Bible, one was physical science in the Bible, and one was archaeological science in the Bible. So we're going to kind of do some of those again and kind of update them, and so that we'll be doing that every other Wednesday night for a few, few Wednesday nights. Anyway, so we come to the end of Nehemiah here, and, uh, you know, I'm always, when we come to the end of, you know, I, I kind of like to study books, and uh, books of the Bible, and it's always sad when, you know, we've kind of done uh, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, because they kind of come together in the history of the last 400 years of uh, the Old Testament, so it's actually been, been doing this about a year and a half. And I try to read everything, get my hands on during that time. And so it's kind of like we're coming to the end of a, a friendship almost, like I'm going to leave them behind, you know. It's, it's kind of a sad thing because I really have enjoyed these folks, you know. They really have taught us a tremendous, tremendous a lot. And, and the, you know, one reason I enjoy studying books is it's kind of like Forrest Gump said, you know, it's kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You know, topical studies are good. You know, I don't do many of those, but, you know, when you do topical study, you say, okay, I'm a we're going to talk about this, so then we go find passages that fit that. 
But when you study a book, you just kind of go into it, and okay, you just take what it gives you. And I really have enjoyed uh, some of the lessons that we've learned from Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. Anyway, so we always start with a quick review. Not sure how many of you were here the last few times, but uh, so Nehemiah's closing, we're at the end of the Old Testament history. After this comes 400 years of biblical silence until the New Testament and the birth of Jesus occurs. And uh, as Ezra is opening, uh, King Cyrus of Persia, uh, and we learn from Josephus that apparently Daniel was aged at that time, an uh, advisor to the king, and he actually told Cyrus, or showed Cyrus, where in the prophetic statements of the prophets from hundreds of years previously that God named Cyrus as the king who would deliver his people back to the promised land. So Cyrus did that. He funded their return. He funded the temple rebuilding. Uh, and so, so through these books of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah, Esther and Nehemiah, we've, we've seen some great people. Zerubbabel, Ezra, Esther, Mordecai, Nehemiah, those kind of the great leaders that we've seen. And we've seen how each of them stood tall for God, no matter what the circumstances were, no matter what the challenges were. Uh, they just kind of each, you know, said, I, I stand for God no matter what. And certainly they've been, been great examples for us. And then last time we talked about kind of the unsung heroes. Uh, we had Joe Perry's funeral yesterday, and Pastor and I were talking about he's, he's kind of one of those behind the scene unsung heroes because he. You know, he, he wasn't an upfront type of guy, but let me tell you, he was always on the back end helping out doing something. And just like we said last week in Arlington Cemetery, you've got, you know, these statues of the great leaders, but then you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of crosses of the unsung heroes who helped the great leaders be, be what they were. Because without the unsung heroes, the great leaders could have never made it. Uh, it takes all of us. It takes all of us. Anyway, so we studied how the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt. That was in Ezra. And then we studied Esther. And then in Nehemiah, we saw how Nehemiah came back from Persia and led the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem and how critical that was back in those days for a city to have both protection and identity. And then I think, the, I think the, uh, when you talk about the box of chocolates, they really great nugget that I found in this lesson. I, uh, you know, if, if you'll look at books on Nehemiah that you go, go by to study, almost every one is about the leadership of Nehemiah, and, and certainly that is true. But uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10 I found actually incredibly important, and that is the study of the first great revival in the biblical history, and how really that was probably much more important, the rebuilding of the people's faith, than just simply the rebuilding of the wall or the rebuilding of the temple. Um, and you say, well, why was that important? Well, you know, a church building is just a building. So a temple is just a temple. But if you don't have a community of faith within that building, the building's nothing. The building, it's just another, you know, bricks and stone and mortar. Uh, you know, if you, if you travel to Europe, which is very, very much a post-Christian nation. You know, in, in every city there's great, great cathedrals that are absolutely empty. Some of them may be museums. Some of them are places where tourists go in and take pictures, but they're not places where people go and worship God. You can go to the Northeast United States, the 13 colonies, the original 13 colonies where people came to America for the very purpose of religious freedom to worship God without being told how to do it. And in those, in those areas of our nation, there are lots and lots of empty churches. There's no longer communities of believers there. Very much a post-Christian area of America. And so, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and I'm not sure where this, uh, this speaker got his uh, information. But he was talking about, polls have shown that before COVID hit, in America, about 20% of the population 
attended a religious service at least fairly regularly. Two years later, we're at 8%. Because that gave a lot of people who were just nominal Christians, cultural Christians, social Christians, whatever you want to call them, an excuse to just kind of float out. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people here in Duncan. There's some churches in Duncan kind of like that too that have, that have affected tremendously in the last two years. You know, thankfully we're, we're coming back up and have just almost where we were before, before COVID. But I think that's the exception in Duncan. And so if the trend continues and we don't do something about it, in Stevens County, in five or ten years, we're going to have a bunch of empty churches. So when we studied chapter 8, 9, and 10, this great revival, I challenge you to make a covenant with God because that's what the Jews did. I challenge you to do what the Jews did when, they were revi- when their faith was revived and, you know, part of mine, I read you my entire covenant, but part of one sentence in mine said, I'm simply a vessel for the Spirit of God to draw others to Christ. You know, when I was writing that was when my brother was ill in the hospital and eventually died. And I saw, so I really, it's a time, kind of been a time of self-examination for me and remembering that, that, that I'm not mortal, just like you are not mortal. We don't have the promise of tomorrow. You know, I'm, I was Joe Perry's doctor, and I can tell you a month ago, he was doing just fine. Yeah. And when the cancer came back, it came back with a rage, and it just took him down so fast. And one day he could carry on a conversation, and the next day he couldn't. That could be any one of us. Any one of us, any day. So all of us need to really consider our lives, our purpose our opportunities each day and not live a day without regrets that we're not doing everything we can for God to be a witness to this world in this world that's that's people are being lost every day um, and so one of the realizations I had was that you know I've been a family doctor here for 30 years and I've got most of my patients I've seen for at least 20 years so here, these, this, I have this group of people that come see me that obviously trust me if they keep coming back. And I think most of them know that I'm a, I'm a believer. But I got to thinking, you know, one of these days I'm going to retire. And after I retire, I'll probably never see most of those people ever again. And so I became convicted that I need to speak of Jesus to each one. I need to cast the net because I have an influence that I'm not using in in every case that I should. And what about you? Every one of you has a circle of influence of people that you know, people that like you, people that trust you. Whether they know it or not, it's probably because the type of person you are, because you're a believer, you have, have ethics, you have uh, you have the spirit living within you and you're the type of person that people like and people trust. And so have you used that influence to draw them to Christ? Are you wasting that influence that God has given you? Because the day will come when those people you'll never see again for some reason or other. So let me just kind of give you some examples. I, I, you know, I ask people. Uh, for instance, I saw a couple of days ago, I saw a lady who was 78, and I've been seeing her for 25 years, and, and uh, we're going through her medical history, and she had survived two serious cancers, cancers that kill almost everybody. And she had been healed of two. And now she's healthy, doesn't take one pill, very healthy woman. And I said, I said, I hope you're thankful to God that you've been healed of two cancers. She said, oh, I thank God every day. And I said, 
do you have a church home? She said, no. Me and my husband kind of quit going to church about 40 years ago. But I thank God every day that he's healed me of cancer. And so uh, that's the number one response when I ask people to have a church home. Well, I used to go. Or when I was a kid, my parents took me or my grandparents took me. But I just kind of got out of the habit. We have thousands of people in Stevens County that have, will give you that answer. And yet, deep down, I think they just need somebody to ask them. They need somebody to speak. And if you're a person that they admire and, and, and have trust in and they like, they're more likely to respond to you than somebody that knocks on a door they've never seen before. Right? I've been surprised when I ask that question. It's very infrequent that I hear the answer, yes, I have a church home, and this is it. Isn't that sad? That's an infrequent answer. I've been absolutely shocked. So, uh, oh, Kathy, and Kathy was telling me, you know, Kathy, if you've met Kathy, she has never met a stranger. You know, I, I'm, I'm a little more introverted than she is. I have a little more difficulty talking to strangers than she does, but, I mean, she can be a stranger's best friend in five minutes. She was telling me that she was over at Lawton last week, and this, she told me this the evening she, when she came home, and she was talking to a salesman, and she was witnessing to the salesman, about 30 years old, and, uh, and, you know, after she kind of witnessed about her faith, she talked about how great her church was, her home church was, Ray Hope Church. And she was saying it's a non-denominational church. And the young man said, excuse me, ma'am, what's a non-denominational church? And so she tried, she explained that, and he said, well, you know, I've never been in the church house in my life. There's a lot of people out there like that. You know, we... we we kind of think we're in the Bible Belt. But Stevens County, Oklahoma, are, are rapidly becoming post-Christian. And we need to wake up to that. Anyway, so let's... Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the lesson, okay? I just, I just, I've been ruminating about these things. And I think the, the study about the revival in 8, 9, and 10, and then how they react to that, it all brings us to this lesson, which is called the joy of the Lord. So, let's, uh, so it's interesting that Nehemiah, they finished building the wall in chapter 6. Okay? Here we are in chapter 12. Now he says, let's celebrate finishing building the wall. You say, well, why didn't he do that back in chapter 6? And I think it's because he realized that when they finished building the wall, they still needed the revival of their faith. Because for them to truly experience rejoicing in the Lord, you first to have a revival of faith. You can't just conjure up joy in the Lord if you're really not living by faith. And so he waited till this revival had come, until they were active in their faith. And now, he says, now we're ready to celebrate the finishing of the wall and rejoice in the Lord. Okay, verse, let's see here. Verse number, back up just a minute here. Okay. Okay, uh, 1227, at the dedication of the wall, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. So Nehemiah had waited till their faith had been revived to dedicate the wall of Jerusalem. Now, if you go back to chapter 8 where they started the revival, he and Ezra started this revival, he told them then, 
verse 10, 8, 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So he knew that uh, true joy, not just worldly happiness based on circumstances, is tr true joy is really only in the Lord. It can only be experienced if you have a life-changing, active faith in God. And then verse 30, when the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. So before they really start this celebration of joy, they had to undergo purification. And so that's a good principle, that before we can celebrate the joy of the Lord, we need to undergo personal purification. You know, if we're still living lives of sin and hypocrisy, it's really hard for us to truly understand the joy of the Lord. Uh, the psalmist David reminds us that in, in Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. So spiritual, if you think about this, spiritual purification should come with the same motivation that physical purification. If you, let's think about our lives in the physical sense for a minute, okay? So how many of y'all eat off dirty dishes? No, we, we clean our dishes. We want our dishes clean when we eat off them, right? We want our dishes pure. We want our food to be pure. We don't eat rotten food. You know, we don't drink dirty water. We like our air to be clean. We don't like polluted air. Uh, we don't put on filthy clothes. And so here we have this focus, this motivation for our physical body of purity as far as hygiene. But if that's so, why do we tolerate impurity in our spiritual life? See, that's inconsistent. It's inconsistent. And so God's the same way. What Psalmist was telling us here, God has work to do through us, but God doesn't want to use dirty vessels, just like we don't want to eat with dirty vessels. He said... The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, that's the one who can stand in his holy place. That's the one who can ascend the mountain of the Lord. That's the one who can receive a blessing from the Lord. The one who has clean, clean hands and a pure heart. And so that's why purification is so important. You know, it's easy to say, well, you know, I, was, I was, came to God in faith, you know, I've been baptized, I've been cleansed, so why don't I have to worry about that anymore? Well, it's kind of like your car. You ever take your car to the car wash or wash it by hand? I remember years ago we washed it by hand. Well, you get your car all clean. Does it stay clean the rest of its life? No. As it goes through life on the road, your car gets dirty again, right? So it's still your car, but you have to clean it every once in a while. You see, that's the way with our lives. We, we go through life as Christians and we just kind of pick up some of the dirt of the world so we don't just let it cake up and cake up and cake up and weigh us down, but we need to kind of stop and examine our lives and purify our lives before God because get rid of some of that worldly stuff that's kind of, kind of jumped up on us. I was, I was thinking of a, talking about living in filth. I, when I was, I guess, a sophomore in college, I was a dorm wing supervisor, you know, so I got my room free that way, so it was my job to kind of keep peace in the dorm, you know, in the, in the boys' dorm there at Lubbock Christian College, and uh, so they assigned me a roommate, and it was this, this young man who, I'm not sure what he was taught when he was growing up, but it wasn't much because... He didn't change his sheets the entire semester. And I don't think he took a bath except maybe on Saturday night. And he chewed tobacco. And he had this, remember these coffee cans, old Folgers coffee cans, the three-pound coffee can? 
he'd use that for a spittoon, but he never washed it out or cleaned it out. So by the time half the semester was over, it was just growing mold. And his sheets were truly brown from dirt. And he just kept getting in them and just slept that way. And I just thought, I can't, you know, how do you stand that, you know? But anyway, yeah, he, uh, he only lasted one semester for some reason or other. But um, I just thought, you know, you need to kind of pay attention to personal hygiene and personal purification. But nobody had taught him that or made him responsible. Maybe mama did everything for him. Maybe his mama was one of the early parachute parents that didn't believe in making kids responsible. Anyway, but, you know, the same thing with us. The, you know, as we travel through life, just like our car does, we pick up the dirt of the world. And that's not necessarily saying we're bad people. It's just saying that we're humans. And we pick up some, maybe some bad habits or we pick up some you know, thoughts we shouldn't have. But we need to sit down and purify our thoughts, purify our habits, purify our lives so that we can be vessels for God to use. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us, there's that word again, from all unrighteousness. So we can see here that in order to get to the joy of the Lord, holiness precedes the joy of the Lord. So purification precedes celebration. Okay, then we come in uh, chapter 12 of Nehemiah to 31, the first part of 30, 31. I had the leaders of Judah go up to the top of the wall... I assigned two large choirs to give thanks. So we can say here that authentic celebration always involves thankfulness. So if we're going to, if you say, I want the joy of the Lord, there's going to be some thankfulness included in that. A genuine spirit of thankfulness is always ex expressed to God. It's deep gratitude for what God has done for us. You know, when I was studying this, I thought about, I thought about our, our big holidays in America, and I thought about people that are secular that really have no relationship with God. And I thought, so, so they get together for Thanksgiving. Everybody brings some food, eat turkey and pumpkin pie, but they really have nobody to be thankful to because they have no, it's just a gathering is what it is. Or how about Christmas? You know, they have Christmas tree, they have presents, they may light up the house, have Santa Claus, reindeer. But, you know, there's no real thankfulness to God for his son coming to earth to save us from our sins. Or what about Easter? You know, the folks that, that have no relationship with God, you know, to them it's just a time where you hunt Easter eggs and Maybe the Easter Bunny brings some presents to the kids and we all get together and have a good time. You know, we're, nothing about worshiping God or thanking God because there's no relationship there. And so what, what were holy days now just become worldly holidays. You know, holiday comes from the word holy days. But to many folks, they're not holy days. They're just a time to get together and have a good time. So they have no one to thank because they don't have no relationship with God. So giving thanks to God for us as Christians is an honor and a privilege. Giving thanks to God is an honor and a privilege. It's a celebration of who we are. You know, when we celebrate Easter, when we celebrate Christmas, when we celebrate Thanksgiving, you know, we, we do this because we recognize that God gave us these things. God gave us all that we, he's responsible for all we are, all we, all we have, and certainly the fact that we are saved through his son Jesus. Anyway, so you go back to that verse. He says, I assigned two large choirs to give thanks. So we're going to look and kind of see what they did. Uh, get your map out. Let's see here if I've got my map out. Yep, there's my map. Okay. So when we, when we studied chapter 3, 
that was when they were starting to rebuild the walls and the gates. We actually used this map then. You may recognize it. That was a few months back. We talked about how archaeology has, has proven that this description, Nehemiah's description of the walls and the gates in chapter 3 are 100% archaeologically correct. So, so chapter 3 of Nehemiah is actually one of the proofs of the Bible that archaeology has absolutely proved he was spot on in his description. So it's not a fairy tale. So what, what we learn from archaeology is this wall that they built. So, so on your map here, the white part is old Jerusalem that they built the wall around. It's about 2.4 miles around. Archaeology has shown us that that wall was about 40 feet tall. So about four stories tall. And the top, the top of the wall was about eight feet wide. And then, of course, it slanted down and out, so the bottom was about 16 feet wide. So I think Pastor Mike has said it's 44 feet to the top here. So almost to the top is how tall that wall was. Or you could... Uh, you know, I think a four-story hotel is about 40 feet. So like the Hampton Inn or the Holiday Inn, those are about four stories high. So that's how, big, how, that's how tall that wall was. And you think about them building that. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Anyway, so it's 2.4 miles long, 40 feet tall, 8 feet tall, 8 feet wide at the top. So where they're going to start this these two choirs is at right here where my finger is at the valley gate so Nehemiah is apparently there's stairs to the top of the wall on the inside of the wall and the two choirs are going to go up to the top of the wall and one choir is going to go to the right or to the southeast I guess you say go around this way the other one's going to come up this way and they're going to meet at the top so each one has gone about 1.2 miles And it's kind of interesting if you look back at chapter 2 when Nehemiah first got to Jerusalem. Remember he, he came from uh, Susa and, and he came with the purpose of rebuilding those walls and it said he went out at nighttime. When he first got there before he called the leaders of Jerusalem together to talk about this project, you remember what he did? He first got out at nighttime with a few of the, apparently the tradesmen that he brought with him from Susa you know, that kind of knew what they were doing on a building. And it says they started at the valley gate, which is exactly where these choirs start tonight. And, and they kind of went around the, to kind of view the project. They want to get an idea for what, what needed to be done. And, it, you know, it may be, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that kind of, kind of make sense that here the celebration Chapter 12 begins at the valley gate, but you know, sometimes the celebrations in our life begin in the valley. And we should start planning for the celebration in the valley because we know that the God's going to bring us through it. So I'm sure Nehemiah, when he went out that first night, was believing in God. He could, he could visualize this finished wall when he went out. Okay, so uh, as we kind of read through some of these verses, um, 12, 31b, one, one, one of the choirs was to proceed to the, to, on the top of the wall to the right. You know, I thought about this. I'm not sure I want to be walking on an eight-foot wall, wide wall that's 40 feet tall. You know, I'd want to be right in the middle of that eight feet, you know. I wouldn't want to be one of the guys on the edge. 12, 31b, one was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate. So that's the gate here at the bottom on the right side. And then it says in verse 36, with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God, Ezra, the teacher of the law, led that procession. So Ezra led the group that's going off towards the dung gate and up that side. Verse 38 and 39, the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I, meaning Nehemiah, so Nehemiah follows that choir. I followed them on top of the wall together with half the people 
past the tower of the ovens, so you can look at your, um, it says tower of the furnaces on the map, but they also call it the tower of the ovens. Uh, to the broad wall over the gate of Ephraim. You see the gate of Ephraim there. The old gate, the fish gate, the tower of Haniel, the tower of Mia, as far as the sheep gate, at the gate of the guard, or Mikfad, they stopped. So that's where they stopped. So apparently there were some stairs down there. So at the Mikfad gate, which means muster or gather, the two choirs get there together, and they come down and they go to the temple grounds to have their celebration. When I was reading about how these, these two choirs were encircling Jerusalem, and you know they're blowing horns, they're singing, they're celebrating, and what they're doing is they're claiming Jerusalem for God. They're ceremoniously, you know, claiming this is God's city. It reminded me of uh, Joshua and, and Jericho. You know, Joshua had, I mean, God had Joshua lead the Israelites around Jericho, you know, once a day for six days and seven times the seventh day. They were claiming that for God. That was the first city as they crossed the Jordan. If you go back and uh, look at Abraham, God told Abraham to go, go the length and the breadth of the promised land to travel it. And it's kind of like, uh, it's almost like a principle that we see in the Old Testament. And there's a really good book, I think I wrote it on your lesson sheet. Uh, Mark Batterson wrote a Bible study book called The Circle Maker. I know several years ago we studied this back in our Sunday school class and about this principle of, of walking around something to claim it and, and dedicate it to God. Because that's kind of what we saw here, that's kind of what we saw at Jericho, that's what God told Abram to do, uh, that there's something to establish God's claim on something in our lives. Okay, let's see here. And then uh, verse, verse 40, this is what happens when they come down to, their, to the temple. 40a, the two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. Verse 41 as well as the priest with their trumpets. Verse 42, the choir sang under the direction of Jezariah. And then the culminating verse, 43. Look at this. This is an amazing verse. Top verse on your second page. On that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. So four times in that one verse, they talk about the joy of the Lord and how they were so loud with their rejoicing that it could be heard far, far away. Remind me of any, you know, I'm from West Texas, so I'm a Texas Tech fan, and Kathy went to OSU, so she's an OSU fan, so... Every time Texas Tech, about every other year when they come to play football at OSU, we go to Stillwater and, and watch the game. And there have been times when we've been a little bit late. And maybe you've done this, coming to a big football stadium, and you're outside the stadium and the game started. And you may be blocks and blocks and blocks away, but you've got 60,000 people in there hollering their lungs out, and you can hear them. And it's contagious. You want to be in there. You want to hurry up and get in there because you're missing out. Right? And so this is what was going on in Jerusalem. It says the, the sound of rejoicing could be heard far, far away. And don't you know the folks that were not in there wanted to be in there. And that's the way it should be with us. We should be so joyful that it draws people to us. It draws people to God through us because of our joy. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, you may be sitting here thinking, well, you know, maybe I hadn't had this joy of the Lord. So we, we go back and say, okay, if you're someone that doesn't experience the joy of the Lord, how do I get there? How do I get that? Well, Nehemiah has given us the blueprint, and that's what we've been studying the last three or four lessons. It started in chapter 8. 
Remember, he did not let them have this celebration because he knew they didn't have the joy of the Lord until first they had a great revival of faith. And specifically in that revival, they had lots of worship coming together to worship God. Number two, it says they even, we even studied where they broke up in 26 Bible classes to further study the Word of God and discuss it among themselves. And then we, we saw how they had a, a long times of contemplative prayer where they reevaluated themselves. And, and specifically, the, uh, it showed us, number one, in those times of prayer, you, you look up. In other words, you look up to God and you praise Him for all He's done for us, for His, for His majesty, for His being the Creator. So, first of all, you start your prayers with praise. And then, in that contemplative prayer, you look back. So, you look back over your life and you see all the things that have gone on in your life and how God has worked through you and sometimes in spite of you. And how times you've been faithful and other times you have not been faithful. And realize that God is God and He's kept His promises in spite of your, your faults. Then number three, you look inward and you really examine your faith and your life. Just like we said the night, purifying yourself and cleansing yourself of all unrighteousness. And then number four, lastly, looking forward, and the way they did that was the way I challenge you to do that, is write out a new commitment to God for your life. Not a do list, but who you are because of because of Christ, who you are. And then, that was chapter 8, 9, and 10, once they had that revived faith, the natural outcome of that was chapter 11, they started looking for things to do to serve God. And we studied all the different ways that they volunteered in the service of God, inside the temple and outside the temple, out in the, out in the city and inside the temple, inside the church building, so to speak. Because that's a natural outcome. When you have a faith that's revived, you're looking for ways to serve God by serving man. Then you're ready to receive the joy of the Lord because you're, you're no longer living for yourself. You're not looking out for number one, worried about what you have or don't have or what you need or what you want to get next week or what you're going to do with this or that or where you're going to go. You're here to serve God because you finally realize your purpose in life as a Christian. You were bought with a price, and we're here to serve God. I came across something this week that was really sad. It's called the World Happiness Report. 2022. This was done by the Gallup pollsters world, worldwide. So they, over a period of three years, they did polls among thousands and thousands of thousands of people in 130 nations and asked questions about all areas of life that had to do with happiness. Now I know we're talking about joy tonight, but this is the Gallup poll and I'm telling you what they said. And so then they ranked the nations of the world based on their happiness. Number 16 was the United States of America. Now, here's my point. So I looked at the 15 above it, and I looked at the percentage of religions in each of those 15. And in America in spite of our post-Christian nation and people not really doing what they say they are, between 70 and 80 percent of Americans still say they are Christian, even though they may not live it or do anything, but still. When I looked at all the 15 nations above us, we were at least 30 points above any of those 15 as far as being people considering themselves Christian. So here's my point. Why should someone who's never heard of Christianity 
be attracted to Christianity if we're no happier or more joyful than someone of the world? What, what's, the, what's the draw? What's, the, what's in it for me? Very famous atheist, philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, incredibly uh, widely studied among uh, world philosophy. Atheist. He said, the best argument against Christianity is joyless Christians. The best argument against Christianity is joyless Christians. Why should I be a Christian if there's no more happiness in being a Christian than not being a Christian? If I'm going to worry about the cares of the world just like everybody else does, if I'm going to let the cares of the world steal my joy, what's so special about being a Christian? If supposedly Christianity is supposed to give you hope and give you a purpose, but your life doesn't show it. His advice to Christians, if your faith truly makes you happy, show it. Live it. So as we close Nehemiah, we need to examine ourselves, each of us. See if we're truly not just feeling, but we're showing and living the joy of the Lord. Because if we are, it will draw people to Christ through your life. If you're not a joyful person, it's going to be really hard for you to draw people to Christ because they're not going to see something new that they want. And if you're overcome by the cares of the world and that snuffed out your joy, you've lost your, 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 you're not an ambassador for Christ. And like we say, if, if you're feeling like you don't have that joy, follow Nehemiah's blueprint. It works. That's what we need to do. We need to worship. We need to pray. We need to gather for Bible study. We need to, to contemplate where we are and who we are and let it bring us to working for the Lord and giving up ourselves and our time to be kingdom builders, to serve God. And then we'll find that joy because we'll have a purpose. We'll have a hope. We'll be different from the people of the world that are overcome by the cares of the world. Anyway, so that's Nehemiah. Hope you got something out of that. And next time we'll start Science in the Bible. All right, thank you very much. Let's stand and have our closing prayer.